So hello and welcome to the Think and Drink, um, Why Voting Matters, presented by Jackson County Library Services, Oregon Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Oregon Cultural Trust. I'm Carrie Tannehill. I'm an adult services librarian here at Jackson County Library Services, the Medford branch. We have three panelists with us tonight to talk about why voting matters. Um, we have Jackson County Clerk Chris Walker and Associate Professor from Southern Oregon University, Bill Hughes, and also Kathy Shaw, who is President of Jackson County Library District Board of Directors, but she's also been the three-time Mayor of Ashland, Oregon, and a successful campaign manager. And I will be introducing them a little more um, in a minute. But our agenda for the night, just to let you know what we're going to be doing, um, the panelists will be answering some questions um, related to why voting matters, how to provide equitable access for all voices, and how to locate reliable voting information sources. And then we're going to take a short stretch break, and then um, the panelists will be available for questions from attendees. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat box. Um, we will be monitoring it throughout the program, and we're also recording this program, as I mentioned. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, if you could keep your microphone muted, and then also turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. So in terms of our panelists, before I introduce them, I just wanted to say the views and opinions expressed in this program are those present of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. So we have our presenters. We have Bill Hughes. He's, as I mentioned, Associate Professor of Political Science, Chair of International Studies Program at SOU. He's taught at SOU and since he moved to Ashland in 1996, he's worked behind the scenes as an unpaid consultant to candidates both Democratic and Republican in California and Oregon. And um, we were very thankful for that he's with us tonight. And we also have Chris Walker. She is the curtain, current Jackson County Clerk. Um, she was um, elected in November 2008. She was re-elected for four terms in 2010, 2014, and 2018. She has over 25 years of practical experience in both elections and reporting programs and has bring, brought an exuberant approach to the citizens of Jackson County by combining her knowledge, enthusiasm, enthusiasm and energy and positive experience to the courthouse environment. And then we also have Kathy Shaw, as I mentioned, she's on our board. And also she um, was the mayor of Ashland. Um, she was the first woman mayor, mayor for the city of Ashland, three terms, first elected in 1989 and served through 2000. She's also a political, she has been a political strategist for democratic and issue-based campaigns um, and used um, her 30 years of campaign experience for nearly a hundred campaigns. She's also developed techniques for over, um, for campaign strategies. She's written the book, The Campaign Manager, Running and Winning Local Elections. It was written in 1996 as a field manual, and now it's in its sixth edition, used as a textbook and university political science coursework. So those are our panelists tonight, and um, we're very happy to have them. And we're gonna go ahead and dig in with our questions. So panelists, are you ready to get started talking about why voting matters? All right, so our first question is what lessons can history teach us about voting in a pandemic? None. History can't teach us anything about this. This is a hundred year event and I, I don't mean to be facetious about it either. Um, there are just too many unknowns, too many variables now that we've never in combination faced before. Sometimes we do face something that's unprecedented, and, and that's what this is. The only real comparable thing, I think, wouldn't be the pandemic of 1919. It would be the Civil War. That was the last time we saw this kind of dislocation with respect to national elections. I, now, my colleagues might disagree, but uh, I thought about this a lot, and I tried to come up with some other, you know, some better answer than none, and I couldn't. So that's the best I can do. Chris or Kathy, who would like to take it next? I'll let Great. Chris go. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kathy. So um, all I can say about voting in a pandemic is I am so grateful we are a vote by mail, the original vote by mail state, because um, we have had uh, certain modifications within our office and of course dealing with people, with the election workers that come in. 
uh, outside of the office environment and the things we do, um, we are business as usual here in our office. And of course, we mail every eligible voter uh, a ballot here in the state of Oregon. Uh, other states may call that absentee voting. But I think um, the only thing I could say outside of that is be prepared for the unexpected because you just never know between pandemic, hurricane, flood, fire, you never know what's going to come at you. And uh, the great part is election officials are very resilient and we're going to get this done. Do you see why I answered oh. none? <laughs> <laughs> Will you think, repeat the question one more time? It's what lessons can history teach us about voting in a pandemic, if any? Well, I'm going to have to agree with both of them. It's um, I'm on um, actually in the trenches. So I'm working on campaigns and trying to figure out how to run a campaign um, when you can't actually talk to voters. Um, and a huge part, especially for Democrats and especially for candidates, um, down ballot candidates have a very difficult time uh, raising money. And there are many ways you can communicate with the populace. You can do lawn signs, you can do mail, television, radio, all of those sorts of things. But um, mail, radio, and television are very expensive. They really are not an option for a grassroots campaign. So um, we have had to design uh, different approaches to campaigning uh, that frankly, I think are kind of working and they're not a whole lot different than what we would typically do in a campaign. So uh, Chris is right, it, uh, because we are an all vote by mail state and have been since 1998, and before that, down, you know, some of the off-year elections were all vote by mail. But since 98, everything has been all vote by mail. Everybody knows what to do here. So um, we know when the ballots are mailed. We know when to peak, when the campaign should peak, and all of that sort of thing. I think it's probably going to be a little more challenging for other states where, first of all, there's been some doubt cast on the efficacy and the legality and, you know, the transparency of voting by mail, all of which seem goofy as hell when I when I hear about it because uh, we've been doing it for so long and now we have what four states that do it. But the campaign trail has had to change. Um, we uh, I do have a candidate that is actually knocking on homes on doors and talking to people, but now you are standing back. You are not. <laughs> going inside for a cup of coffee. You are not, there are no uh, coffees being held anyway, anywhere. They're more like this, like on Zoom. Um, for the most part, we are hanging literature. Um, I've become quite good at hanging literature without touching anything. And um, it's, I mean, there's just all these kinds of things that uh, we're having to be aware of and, and change or modify to, to um, be successful in communicating with the voters. So you mentioned, uh, go ahead. I love the perspective of, as an elections official, um, an academic, and, and a campaign uh, manager. I love the different perspective because I hadn't even thought about your, uh, about uh, Kathy's thoughts concerning that as well as in the academic community. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's good for me to hear that. So um, Kathy mentioned we've been voting by mail since um, 1998. Um, how does voting by mail kind of, um, the method of voting by mail, how does it benefit individuals by voting by mail and how does it hinder them from voting? voting? How do you, what do you think of that question? Uh, well, so I, let me jump in here real quick um, and then absolutely want to hear about the rest. So the difference between voting by mail and poll voting is basically timing. Um, a campaign must have communicated his or her message by the time the ballots are mailed. Um, and I think in a way, uh, having studied this, and, and obviously because of my book, I have to do massive amounts of research every four years when the rewrite comes. Um, I want to say that most people have their minds made up about a month early, and so our our um, ballots are mailed uh, anywhere to about two and a half weeks prior to 
um, the due date. Um, so we always try to peak on the day that the weekend after ballots are mailed. So th that's a little bit different than poll voting versus voting by mail. Voting by mail also saves cam campaigns a lot of money. Before we had all vote by mail, you had to peak twice. You had to peak and do your get out the vote, the GOTV twice. You were going after the absentee ballots. You knew who was voting absentee. You had to have somebody tracking absentee ballots and making sure they got in, although most of them do. They're the most reliable of voters. Um, and you also had to peak on the day that people actually poll voted. That means a campaign has to spend a lot of money between the absentee ballots going out and the actual day that people go to the polls. And no one really comprehends how much more efficient and civilized voting by mail is than poll voting. Poll voting, you have to have massive teams at every polling place and making sure you're checking off who voted, who didn't, that was identified, and you have to circulate those people through. I mean, cell phones certainly helped in that regard because it used to be that we'd have runners going back and forth to the polling place to say, oh, pick up a list and this person already voted and you had people calling and so on and so forth, providing daycare, uh, you know, uh, getting rides, that sort of thing. It was a massive effort. All of that is gone. Um, we basically taper off after ballots are mailed, we start spending less and less and less. And um, I found that about 60% of all those that are gonna vote, well, it used to be when we first started, the 60% of all those who were gonna vote did so in the first week. Um, and now it's changed so that 60% do it in the last week. So, but they've already got their minds made up. I mean, you're, you're just now, so you're just really activating those that you know will be supporting your candidate. Anyway, so what, what do you think, Chris, Bill? Well, this is great information too. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, I think uh, vote by mail has definitely changed the way, we, it, it definitely saves money. And there were uh, studies that were done saying that vote by mail actually costs more. But I think what they're doing is looking at hybrid um, elections. They're looking at, uh, states that still conduct whole polling place or what they call them vote center elections and they send everybody a ballot which we're seeing that model especially like in California this year I think Pennsylvania or maybe New Jersey there's a lot of states moving that direction and that definitely would absolutely throw uh, uh, candidates campaigns um, everything they do it's like running two separate elections yeah um, our model is the true vote by mail model um, and of course, the first vote by mail election was actually conducted in 1981 uh, in Lynn County. It was a combination of Lynn County and Benton County. And the history is actually right on the Secretary of State's website. Um, so the first ever, almost 40 years ago, the first ever vote by mail election was conducted in Oregon. And then it just um, moved forward from there. So this is something that our uh, voters are used to in Oregon. Um, they're, they're used to being able to conduct elections this way. Um, to the rest of the country, they are in a whirlwind thinking, how are we going to do this? But for us, this is way of life. Um, and as a campaign manager um, contributing, I, I, again, I love the different perspective. Uh, Kathy and I talk um, on occasion, and, and I know that she's for out the, throughout the years always come to us for information, for data, so that she can uh, look at these statistics for her campaigns for the thing that she does. But ultimately, what vote by mail, in my mind, as an elections administrator gives, it gives access. It's about making sure that every eligible voter has access to a ballot and that they can easily cast that ballot, because that's what we're here for. So there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Bill, do you have something to add? Um, maybe just a couple of assumptions about vote by mail that turned out to be wrong. Um, that okay. In, in, in terms of the more recent development of vote by mail in Oregon, um, a lot of people forget that the original assumption about vote by mail was that it would benefit significantly conservative and Republican voters. The thinking was that it was compared to absentee voting. And that generally was an older electorate, a more rural electorate. Um, there were, you know, and 
Chris can tell you a lot more about the demographics of that than I can, but, and the idea that that electorate tends in virtually every state to be more conservative. Um, a lot of research had not yet been done. And although a lot of us were trying to advise, I was still in California at that time, to advise people that no, the data don't support a conservative or Republican advantage for mail-in balloting. That's why Governor Kitzhaber, a Democrat, you know, vetoed the first effort of that and stopped it because he really believed that it would distort the, you know, the results of elections in favor of conservative and Republican voters. I mean, there is always that idea that even in the process of governing, party matters. By 1997, both Republicans and Democrats had figured out, oh, you know what, it doesn't work that way. Um, and so Democrats were pushing for a vote by mail initiative and the Democrats, or the Republicans stopped it because they realized this isn't going to help us. This is actually going to hurt us. But ultimately, you know, as, as we've already observed, you know, um, Oregon um, got vote by mail as a consequence of which a state with peculiarly high voter turnout saw its turnout increase even more. Uh, and, and did indeed, I'm gonna to defer to Chris on this for the numbers, but my understanding is that you did cut costs pretty significantly, that there's been no evidence of voter fraud, um, you know, of, at any significant level, that it, it's worked brilliantly well, where a lot of people initially were trying to convince us, no, it won't work, it will advantage one side over the other. None of those things have turned out to be true. It's been an extraordinary success in a, a process that often involves more failure than success. Oregon's been a peculiarly notable success story, I would, I would argue. One of the other interesting things about vote by mail is that prior, and I've, I've uh, studied Jackson County voter uh, returns now for, um, well, since 1986. And what I did see early on when we were uh, doing hybrid, what uh, Chris was speaking of, was that um, the voted, and especially in California where my parents voted, um, many voters aren't paying much attention to the down ballot. And, and oftentimes you have your city elections and your issue-based elections are on the down ballot. So if, if um, you're in a polling place and you're like, oh, I don't know what this is and I didn't quite do my homework, you face uh, as, as a candidate, a down ballot candidate or issue-based campaign, you face ballot roll off um, or ballot fatigue, which is what happened in California because their ballots were just so long. I mean, they were pages and pages and people, people would be just like, I can't do this anymore, I'm leaving. What happens with vote by mail is voters take time to research, they read the voters' pamphlet, or they call friends, or uh, they look online at people's web pages. They um, the the role and and one way that this is proven that they aren't just rolling off of their ballot is that you will see on a ballot now that an undervote. That's when people vote, but they skip a category, and undervotes are virtually not being watched anywhere and people win and lose by the undervote and um i you know, the undervote is so critically important you want people to fill in that bubble and so what happened after vote by mail was that you would see people filling out the top part of the ballot uh they'd skip a couple judges or whatever and then they'd re-engage in the bottom part of the ballot um, uh, Priscilla Southwell, I think is her name, out of University of Oregon, did a number of studies immediately after vote by mail and found exactly what Bill was talking about, that it does not advantage either party. What it does help is the disenfranchised, the people who are younger, the people who move more often, uh, single parents, those working, uh, you know, job, paycheck to paycheck. Those are the people that are advantaged by vote by mail. It becomes extremely easy to vote and, and it's not not, you know, you don't have to register in advance and, oh, the deadline for, vote, you know, voting absentee has been cut off or whatever. You're going to get your ballot. And so what happens is that the disenfranchised tend to be more engaged and paying more attention to what's going on and voting. You have virtually, the ballot roll-off doesn't happen. A down ballot candidates get equal measure. People study the ballot more and they are more informed when they're voting. Those are all good things to happen. Um, absolutely true. And Can I add something to that really quickly? I'm sorry, Chris, this is kind of important because I noticed that one of the questions in the chat was what the effect of mail-in voting was, I'm assuming with turnout. 
and, and I'll, Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is really, I think, important. Not only has pretty uniformly mail-in ballot where it has been institutionalized properly, certainly it has increased um, voting, but something that's often underexplored is generally speaking, it enhances participation. A lot of the things that Kathy was talking about are measures that we use of participation. How much and how in, in how informed a way do you talk about politics? How much do you uh, talk about the election or the local state and national uh, candidates or party issues with others? All those are indications of interest in the campaign and participation, information gathering, all those things seem to be enhanced by areas that have mail-in ballot. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't oh, mean to. No, what we've done is we've reduced, we've gotten rid of the barriers, right? We're, we're, we're sending you a ballot. Um, you have to choose to participate. And that is where engaging in things such as what we're doing right now, it's educating yourself on the measures on the candidates, the things that lead to your passions as a person. Um, and that's how we get participation. Um, I love, Kathy, how you uh, talked about the, can the down candidates, and we do see that still in elections, especially in those judicial races, uh, the not necessarily circuit court, because we have local circuit court, and they're very well-known judges here, but you'll see a lot of the judges of the Supreme Court of Oregon, you'll see the different judicial positions in Salem, that if it's not in your area, those are the biggest ones where we see the undervote category coming in, where they just don't vote on any candidate, um, and especially if there's only one candidate. Um, sometimes people want a choice. Um, and so those are where we really see that high undervote um, in those. And that was really a great uh, piece. I, I, I enjoyed your analogy of that. So um, you know the other thing about vote by mail, a little history too, is even though the first election was in 81, and of course, um, we talked about the legislature and the governor vetoing the, the vote by mail bill. In 1998, a citizens initiative went out and it was really promoted. They gathered signatures to place that on the statewide ballot. And lo and behold, the people voted overwhelmingly. It was 65, 68% to the 30 percentile that this is the way we want to vote in the state of Oregon unlike other states where it is going through the legislative process where that becomes very political, where instead of thinking, hey, what's best for the citizens, it's about what's best for the political parties. Um, but Oregon really set the pace for that because we said, our citizens said, this is how we want to vote. And people say that all the time, well, I just don't understand that. And it's because this is, this is what our citizens want. And I think that's a real testament to the people of Oregon and the resiliency um, of they vote by mail process. So. With yeah, virtually no fraud. Yeah, virtually no fraud. There, you know, there are occasions we do turn in people each election that to the Secretary of State's office, and then they um, they'll do educational letters because most of the time they're people who um, who they did a, we did a replacement ballot ballot for them. They were confused and voted both. Well, mind you, only one counts because we have methods within our processes and procedures that catch that. Anytime we reissue or replace a ballot, the original ballot is inactivated, so it is going to kick out in the system. Um, great, even if there's three to five ballots issued, and I'm just using this as an example, every subsequent ballot um, is going to be the ballot that is basically live. Everything else is going to be inactivated. So the theory that, oh, they're voting four or five ballots just not true. Um, based on their voter profile and the and the barcode that comes through, that is scanned in, and of course that is going to bring up their voter profile. It ties to that, and we're going to know one way or the other. Um, and a lot of times, though, it is actually um, a, a person who, in between the time that we extract data, to actually do the insertion of ballots, which we did that about uh, a, a week ago, two weeks ago. Um, and in between that time and registration deadline, there are weeks involved of, of people updating addresses, of people um, uh, that have moved, um, even the wildfires. So their original extraction already has where they were located at prior to that, but they have until these deadlines to actually update those addresses and get a ballot. So we have been very busy with that. And by virtue of their uh, uh, their action of going online or submitting a new registration, it kicks in that replacement ballot. 
um, so thus making the original ballot inactive. Um, so it just is virtue of how the system works. We have processes and procedures in place to make sure that we uh, mitigate that and that we monitor that and that we catch all of those, um, even if somebody did try to pull a fast one on us. I, I always like to say our, our bigger challenge on the ground is getting somebody to vote once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not voting millions of times. Yeah. It, it, think about um, what Chris is talking about. It, it, Costco, every word does. So where you get a rebate from Costco and you can't find you know, the rebate and you ask for another one and then you find the original and you take the original in. They said, no, nope, now we're dealing with the one that was more recently sent to you. Yeah. So that one is cast out and is no longer accepted. And now you're searching for the new one or asking for another. And so, um, it, it, you know, tracking who has tried to vote multiple times is, is not, uh, it's not a diff it doesn't seem to be, in this day and age to be a difficult process. That that's so, lots of years of, of practical experience too, and lots of uh, trial and error where we perfected that in Oregon um, and other states too, Colorado, Washington, um, Hawaii is rather new, but, but we've done this a long time and, and there's not a lot we haven't seen. So. <laughs> so we have another question in the chat box. I not sure if we answered it already or not, but it was how has the impact been mail voting on state versus national elections with mail-in voting? So how does it impact local elections versus state and national elections? Impact as far as uh, the contract as far as I think, I think there it's um, in terms of the amount of people that vote, like if there's a local state or national election, I think is what they're asking. Depending on what's on the might be able to speak to this too, but I know at least on our end, um, the biggest struggle we have is I tell people all the time there are no insignificant elections. Our local elections are equally as important as this big presidential election coming up. The candidates, the measures on those local elections um, affect your bottom line as a, as a voter, as a homeowner, as a person who has children in school, who has, lives in a fire district, a, a water district, all those different things. But unfortunately, we just don't see the turnout that we do in these big elections. Um, but those are just as important because those are things that are going to affect you at a local level on your everyday life. Right. Um, so it's very unfortunate. And Kathy probably may even have some statistics on this, but um, and because I know you've done those, so I have. Yeah. So in a typical presidential cycle, everybody votes. Um, I don't even run and get out the vote in a presidential cycle. There's little or no reason to. For oh. example, in, four years ago, 92% of Ashland voted. Why would? And I gotta assume that some people are out of town. So why would I get 125 volunteers? knocking on 100 doors each or 125 doors each to activate people who are going to vote. And, and so what we do do is we track um, uh, if a voter always votes, that's a four out of four voter. If a voter usually votes, that's three out of four elections, two out of four elections, one out of four elections, or zero. Um, or if they're a new voter. So what we look for are, and, and it's this, I have an incredibly easy um, formula that I came up with in 2004, where people are like, well, what about the, in, in quotes, independents? Um, all non-affiliated voters are what they call independents, and now independents in Oregon, which is not a party of shared belief. It is a, a, a collection of people that, for whatever reason, have decided not to not to be part of the Democratic or Republican Party or Green or Pacific, you know, or Constitutional, whatever. So, if, for example, in any given precinct, and I'll I'll give you the example of the one that I have in my book, which is Precinct Two in Ashland in 2004, and and I've used this, by the way, in precinct analysis uh, uh, all over states, all over. Um, so in 2004, if you add the Democrats and Republicans together and find out what percent they are of each other, the non-affiliate voters and all third party registrants will fall in those exact same uh, percentages. So if, for example, in 2004, eight out of 10 of the, um, of the R's and D's added together 
were Democrats and two out of 10 were Republicans. So if all non-affiliated voters are gonna basically track party registrants, then the ultimate result would be that 80% would cast a Democratic ballot and 20% would cast a Republican ballot, right? But in that case, I, and I looked at uh, Alan Bates and Jim um, Wright, who were identical uh, all, except for party. I mean, they both uh, supported the exact same things. They're both in favor of the sales tax and you know anything that you or I would care about giving money to, Jim Wright had and Alan Bates had. They were very similar. Um, at any rate, in that particular election, Alan Bates in Precinct 2 in Ashland received not 80%, but 79% of the vote. Jim Wright received 17%, not 20%. So what happened to the other 4%? When well, you look over in the undervote and then you see 4% of the population. If people undervote because they don't know, don't like, or don't care. And, and they leave it up to other people. So now I can attribute the undervote. So I know 3% of those in Precinct 2 undervoted Jim Wright and 1% undervoted Alan Bates. And I can go merrily through Jackson County and see are Republicans or Democrats undervoting their their party's candidate? But lots of times you can determine, oh, it's because of the quality candidates and, and candidates do matter. The quality candidate does matter. So you can go through and see, okay, who's undervoting? Is it the Republicans or the Democrats? Uh, when I did this for uh, Lane County a while ago where um, a legislative in 06 or a legislative See, was held by a Republican with a 10-point registration advantage Democrat. Once I looked at it through the vote zone formula, that's what I call it, um, it turned out that all 10% that the 10 percent of Democrats, and it's only Democrats, were undervoting their party the candidate. So we, it's like, well, it, it becomes very simple. You say, all right, you need to put the fear of God into the people that are voting, that you must fill in that bubble. They can't undervote. Once they, if they're undervoting, they're abdicating that vote over to whoever does color in the bubble. And so um, the, the whole idea of, of you know, determining who's gonna vote where and what election becomes critical. So a presidential cycle, as I said, too many people vote to even bother with a GOTV. In a midterm cycle, especially a midterm primary, where you have, let's say 34% typical voter turnout, and that used to be typical in Ashland. Once we started the neighborhood captain program where we had 125 people knocking on over 100 doors here in Ashland, we, because we knew to pass the library district, we had to we had to swamp the boat with Ashland basically. So we had to change that voter turnout from 34% all the way up to 65%. That's doubling, you know, almost doubling the voter turnout. And and so in other areas, we knew just mathematics. It all becomes mathematics. How how what's the percent that we need to get? In Medford, we need to break even in Medford. We need to break even in in um, uh, Jacksonville and and the points around Jacksonville, and we had to get um, uh, a higher percentage turnout in Phoenix and Talent. But Ashland, everybody predictably votes by the same percentages for libraries that they always have. Why would it change? If somebody has voted in every single election since the earth cooled, why would they not be voting in this one? We do not even knock on the doors of four out of four voters. We do not knock on the doors of three out of four voters. We assume that they will perform and they will vote. We only go to the voter to the doors of the voters who occasionally vote that we believe, based on votes owed formula, will actually cast Asked about for our candidate. That cuts the work of our of our volunteers. It cuts the work of and it cuts the cost of a campaign enormously. We run campaigns so cheaply now compared to what we used to do when we knocked on everybody's door and harassed people and called them all the time. We don't do that anymore. It's much more um, uh, targeted. We have a really good idea of who will support our people. We do not ask our volunteers to ID at the door, which they always hated doing. We just tell them, activate this person. If you know that 80% of Ashland is gonna cast a yes ballot for the library, you can knock on every door because those are good good numbers. In, in, in uh, let's say Eagle Point, where seven out of 10 vote no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do any untargeted activities out there. I'm just not. Because if I turn out seven no votes for every three yes votes, I'm wasting time and money. 
uh, there I'm IDing personally, having personal volunteers ID my yes voters and only they are activated. And that, again, cuts the cost, cuts the effort, cuts the volunteers, all of that happens so that you can have a better outcome for your issue-based campaign or whatever candidate you support. So we have interject real quick on that just I, I love that Kathy and you know another uh, uh, group that benefited during that same election of course was the GMO measure right um, because and, and it really was specific what she was just talking about those voters that you knew were traditionally voted yes they normally are going to not only support library but also support uh, things such as like the GMO measure as well as even the extension district because they all kind of those two kind of intertwine with each other it was really interesting to see those um, abstracts after the election and to see exactly where and the high voter turnout was just key um, in Ashland, absolutely. And, and you bring up a good point because as I, what I call the pleasure of your company, you want to combine like with like. So for example, in the GMO campaign that uh, Chris is referencing, we coordinated the GOTV. You don't yeah. want to be on top of each other. So the entire GOTV and all the neighborhood captains, everybody were, were working together. So we had, had knew exactly who was going to be voting yes on each of them. In the case of GMO, they had done actual ID, and we had too in in um, areas outside of Ashland. Um, we ID. We didn't ID anybody in Ashland, but we ID outside of Ashland, and we looked at who the IDs were on the GMO. We combined efforts so that their volunteers were turning out our support. Yeah. Our volunteers were turning out their support because they're just you. You. It's really hard to get. And in that particular campaign, we had over 500 people working as neighborhood captains. It was an insane effort and and so the two campaigns like i said the pleasure of your company the two campaigns can put put all of their volunteers together and work together and reduce the effort great grassroots effort effort for sure yeah we had a, a another question that clarified the other question that they wanted to know what is the timeline for campaigning and when can signs be placed in yards and did that change when oregon went to mail and ballot Yes. Go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it changed in Ashland. Uh, it used to be Ashland when it was poll voting, it was uh, one month ahead, and which meant that basically you had your lawn signs up for two weeks before people voted. It was ridiculous. So the city of Ashland changed that. I think it's six weeks now. I think Jackson County is much more lenient and as is Medford. So um, that, did, that did change, it got extended. You wanna get your lawn signs up so that they're up at least a month before um, uh, people start casting a ballot. Uh, so, and there's two different th think, you know, thoughts on how to do lawn signs, which are, by the way, a very, um, uh, what do you call it there? Uh, what's a relationship? It's, it's a high maintenance relationship. So you have lawn signs going up and, and, and the big boom, which is a, you, you put them up the day that they are allowed to go up and put up as many as you can. But then there's a slow crawl, which is you put some up on the day they're allowed and then you continue to grow that, that number. And uh, I think both of them work very well. Um, but uh, in the library, we did a big boom and immediately ran out of signs and had to print more. Um, but it's it, that did that timing is timing is the difference between vote by mail and poll voting. It is all about timing. And you know, each municipality um, in the county um, can have sign rules uh, and even temporary election sign rules. So we always give a list out to candidates about and the measure committees that you need to contact each municipality. There is no uniformity. Uh, the county really doesn't have a lot on it, but it does fall to the Oregon Department of Transportation and what their rules are pertaining to say, a uh, sign at the end of a major intersection, if it's gonna block people's view, they're gonna get rid of those signs um, because you cannot um, block people's view to be able to turn or any of those things. So. County's pretty open about that, but really it's municipalities that have some of the restrictions. And, and again, we refer people to each of those places, uh, depending on if it's a county candidate uh, and, in, and, and placing in an unincorporated incorporated area compared to an actual municipality uh, within the city limits. Um, and usually in the county, it's more of a gentleman's agreement uh, type issue. Um, we see a lot of them will go 
30 days, 60 days. But there are campaigns that I've seen that the minute they file in December, January, they're putting signs out. Um, so it just depends on your philosophy and, um, and uh, your campaign manager to what you feel is going to be most effective in your campaign. And I will say that uh, if, uh, when I see, for example, here in Ashland, I, I, people are running for local office, right? When I see a lawn sign that is underneath the stop sign on a cor corner in the median strip, which is absolutely illegal, and when I see a candidate sign there, my feeling is you want to serve in, in city hall and yet you're not willing to follow the rules. Yeah. And, and so not everybody, I, I, you know, necessarily knows the rules, but I certainly noticed that um, in terms of the Department of Transportation, the field signs can run as much as 300 to $400 each. And then it takes a crew to get out there and put them up so they don't blow over or do whatever. If you are in the right of way of the, you know, ODOT, they don't give you a call or gently take those signs down. They are ripped down and you have to find out which yard they were taken to so they can be reinstalled. And right away along 99 and whatnot go way back. I mean, it's like, why even bother? So um, yeah, there's all kinds of rules. And, and I think it, it behooves candidates and campaigns to know what those rules are. Haven't Bill? heard from you, Bill. Yeah. Bill, do you have yeah. anything to add on this yeah. topic? No, most of this is local, and I, I sort of figured that my designated assignment here was to sort of take us back to 30,000 feet at the national level mm -hmm. where this stuff isn't quite as relevant. So um, if we, one thing that's been kind of left out of the discussion, because, primarily because it's local, and, and most local elections are at least technically nonpartisan, um, Kathy said earlier, well, for some reason, people don't register by party. I wanted to talk about that, if we have time, yeah, just a couple of minutes. Um, at the national level, not at the state level and not at the local level, but at the national level, the single most significant change in electoral politics with respect to that has been the movement away from both parties. It's a trend called de-alignment. What was going on in the 70s, and I will race through this pretty quickly, is as a consequence of decades of effort by the Republicans to break the old sort of New Deal coalition of the Democratic Party. The Democrats were a national majority party. It's the last time we had one, okay? Finally, what they were able to do was break off pieces of that coalition, but it took decades for them to do that. What happened was um, there were certain cohorts of people, mostly in the South, mostly working class people in the South. It's called a secular realignment. That is people moved from one party to another, okay? But nationally, what was happening was that people were moving out of the Democratic Party in large numbers, mostly white men, okay, compared to earlier decades, along with um, people moving out of the Republican Party, and it's called de-alignment. In other words, there was a loss of confidence in the two political parties, okay. Part of this is what I think Kathy was indicating, though, which was the movement toward what are called candidate-centered campaigns and elections, where the party matters less than the candidate. Kathy made a very important, well, she made a number of very important observations, but one of them is that I would argue that now more than it, you know, than, than in the past, the candidate matters more than the party. And Donald Trump's a classic example of that. So was Barack Obama, because a lot of the same people voted for both of them. That's a consequence of de-alignment, of a general loss of confidence in the political parties at the national level. It also explains things like voter suppression, which we might get into later. How do you govern the country when you are, in fact, a minority party? And both the Democrats and the Republicans now are nationally minority parties. The, the, the largest cohort of people nationally right now is split somewhere between registered Democrats and people who register as nonpartisan or third party, okay? Republicans are less than 30% of the electorate nationally. And yet, as we've seen, they govern an extraordinary amount of the country. Well, how do you do that? You know, that's, we may get into that later, but it's by way of explaining that whether or not people should, people have moved away from that kind of, kind of non-reflective alliance to political parties. Back in the 1960s, people who do what I do for a living could accurately predict how someone was going to vote by knowing who they were registered with. And Kathy was talking about this, who they voted for in the last two elections. You can't do that as accurately anymore nationally. Okay. 
And not even just in presidential elections because of the Electoral College, but a lot of things have complicated that, including the way media cover campaigns, um, the way parties are less relevant, that candidates self-select, dominate the primaries. The primaries are dominated by the smallest and most extreme cohorts of both parties, rather than the rank and file and the independent voter and things like that. I'm registered as an independent. I can't vote in the primaries. And by the way, I shouldn't be able to. I think I don't, that's fine. I don't struggle with that. But that changes the nature of the candidates we see. So parties work differently than they have at any time since they were first created after the Civil War, arguably, when they consolidated. There's a lot so, there to unpack, but. Uh, jumping on that, uh, about 34% of Jackson County registered voters now are third party or, or non affiliated. That's, that's uh, equal to the national. Figure. National as well, yeah. So it, using the votes owed formula, because now I can see swing, right? Because I can see who moved over and voted because they're, they're getting more votes than they're owed or fewer than they're owed. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2008, there were only five precincts in all of Jackson County that had any swing at all, any. Right. Otherwise they came in directly on both sides. Right. The non-affiliated tracked the partisans by the exact same percentages. Those five precincts were all in East Medford, every one of them. Mm -hmm. So now all I have to do to get a candidate to win is campaign in East Medford. That's where all the swing is. Ashland is gonna come in exactly on votes owed. Talent is, Phoenix. So when I'm working a Senate district, like for Alan Bates, mm -hmm. I now have Alan Bates only in what was old 48. I just need you to canvas there, we'll canvas the rest of it, because that is the only area that swings. And it swung by 10 points. In order to find out if it was the non-affiliated, the Democrats, or the Republicans that were swinging, we called through, Jackson County Democrats called through 25,000 people in Medford and um, out to Jacksonville and then parts of, of Phoenix. In the areas where it swung left, they called Republicans and non-affiliated. In areas where it swung right, we called Democrats and non-affiliated and, and discovered, after, and not all 25,000 answered, but we discovered that the swing, if 10% if of the Republicans were swinging, that's exactly the same percentage of non-affiliated that were swinging. They not only mirrored each other in how they voted, but they mirrored each other in, in if they were going to swing from one party to the other. One great example of that is Dave Dotter, who is running currently for county commissioner. He ran against Alan Bates in 2010. In 2008, he requested a Barack Obama lawn sign. Can I just build on that with one more national figure that a lot of people never think about, including MSNBC and Fox News? The last, the last seven presidential elections, right, of the last seven, four of those, no candidate got 50% of the vote. Right. Who won? Okay, that's important because that's an indication, among other things, of the likelihood of relatively weak political parties. Because if there's a majority party, that's not gonna happen. We haven't seen that nationally in a century. You know, the whole electorate is changing because of a lot of the things Kathy's talking about at the local level, they just are extrapolated as you move up through the state level to the national elections. And you, you, know, you try to target those swing areas, those, those areas where like people who are not registered with either political party, the challenge there is twofold. It's not just to get them you know, to vote for your candidate, you gotta get them to vote. Period. For, because there's an extraordinary degree of detachment you know, from, from trust in the system and things like that, that's much more characteristic of the registered nonpartisan voter. There are all sorts of challenges now. And so what we're seeing now is essentially minority candidates winning. Hillary Clinton, you know, beat Donald Trump pretty soundly, but she still didn't get 50% of the vote. You know, Bill Clinton never got 50% of the vote. He ran twice. Okay. Um, you know, that's astonishing. That's really astonishing. If you look at the historical sweep of American national elections. And just to let you know, getting back to the theme of this, uh, and on the importance of voting, Michigan uh, went to Donald Trump by an average of two votes per precinct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good call. 
So we're um, kind of at the point that we were going to take a little stretch break, but we did get one question in chat. Um, so I was wondering if we could address that really quickly before we went could on we break. Actually, it, could we come back to it? Because one of the things I need to do, I don't have a single light turned on in my house. Okay. But it's so starting to look like a cryptid. Andrew, the first time we'll, right when we get back from our break, which will be about nine minutes or so, um, we will answer your questions. So we appreciate your patience on that, but feel free to take a stretch break. Bill, yeah, turn some lights on. You're getting a little dark there. <laughs> well, he, he looks like he's a, a witness protection. Yeah, he kind of <laughs> does. Okay. So we'll be back probably in about nine, 10 minutes or so. So feel free to get up and stretch or um, walk around or get some beverages or food. Um, and, and all this nonsense because the interest or, or more importantly voter suppression is probably you know yeah i think that is a common question i think in the united states so i think it's one we should address but well, uh, i think it's i think it's one of the questions i'm looking let's see yeah i didn't have what a the question to keep individuals from voting mm -hmm. uh you know and uh that, that's kind of an interesting discussion One of the things that I didn't touch upon, I know people are probably still coming back, but um, in terms of timing, uh, Jackson County, um, it, and I'm sure all of Oregon, I mean, data is cheap, cheap, cheap. I, I, get, uh, I get daily from the county emailed to me who's actually cast a ballot and who hasn't. And uh, we remove from the list anybody who's already cast a ballot and we don't bother them again. What, um, before Chris was uh, there, actually, and before vote by mail was fully, you know, energized, uh, the county would post on a regular basis, um, you know, each of the batches that they that they processed, and we took screenshots of those. What was, and then we compared that with the at the end with um, who voted when. So the final activity report that we get from the county actually tells us who voted on what day. Um, the snapshots, um, and the last time we were able to do that was 06, the snapshots would show us the undervote. And, and so as we got closer to the election, to the, you know, as people voted later in the process, the undervote would go up at the same time as younger voters turned out to vote. So we knew that, un, that you know, older voters were the first surge and they stayed pretty steady. But the last week and the last few days was when younger voters actually got their ballots in. And that's when the undervotes started going through the roof. And, and so we knew that uh, we had hit older voters first and then we could come back through on younger voters later and encourage them to vote all the way down the ballot. Um, because that's where we were losing down ballot races was because of the undervote. And um, uh, so that was, the, the county has so much transparency of who votes, when they vote, and provide that information timely and affordably uh, to campaigns. It's, it's a real head scratcher, right? And I, I think I, Chris and I were talking about this a while ago. Once you do all vote by mail, you never go back. It's cheaper, campaigns love it. It saves money for the campaign, saves money for the county, the state, all of that. And more people vote. It's, it's really, it's kind of, you know, no brainer. And I think a lot of states, it's fear of the unknown. They look at our model yes. and I get comments all the time at national conferences. How do you guys do that? We could never do that. And I look at them and say, do you have absentee voting? Well, yeah. <laughs> 100 Absentee voting is vote by mail. Um, we <laughs> just send all of our voters a ballot. And, and a lot of people are just, they scratch their heads. I find especially like in the 13 original colonies back in the Eastern states, um, even Texas, people just are just dumbfounded on how it works so well here in Oregon. Um, in fact, up till two years ago, I'd never heard the term, uh, um, what is it, ballot uh, harvesting. Um, you know, that was just, the, the term was foreign. Even though I understand what it means, it was like we'd never heard that term specifically when it comes to ballots. So, um, and we've, we've been, been 
we, um, I've been ballot harvesting ever since vote by mail um, started. And um, so whenever we knock on the door, we say, yeah. hey, head into the library, you want us to take your ballot. Now, the thing about harvesting ballots is, for example, if a stranger came to my door and said, gee, I noticed your ballot isn't in yet, do you want me to take it? I'd say no. But if if a friend <laughs> yeah. did, if a friend came to the door and said, hey, Kathy, I'm heading up to the library, you want me to take your ballot? I'd say, absolutely, thank you. Yeah. So um, I don't understand why anybody would relinquish their ballot to somebody they didn't know. No. Um, and I know they've made that, oh, this is a big deal and they're changing whatever. Um, obviously, I mean, it's, nothing is worth going to prison for. No. So I, I just, I've never found that to be a problem here. I, you can actually predict based on turnout, it originally vote by mail, you could predict what the turnout would be by how many people voted in the first week. And then you're just going after the number that you need to get to a win. <laughs> you know what's interesting in Oregon too is that um, it is allowed um, to allow somebody to take your ballot in, whether it be a family member, a friend, or even a person who does have an unofficial ballot drop box. Yeah. We don't encourage it. I do not encourage it. I would never recommend that people give their ballots to somebody who shows up at their door. But as long as they meet the statutory requirements, people can go door to door and collect ballots. I remind them though, you are taking that voter's right to vote into your hands. And if those ballots do not make it to us by eight o'clock election night or in an official ballot drop box by eight o'clock, you have single-handedly removed that person's uh, right to cast their ballot. Um, we did see this um, in Portland a couple years ago during the campaign and I really don't think it was intentional one person thought one was going to return them, the other thought the other was, and the next day they discovered a group of ballots that were left um, up at the uh, headquarters. Um, I can't remember the exact group, but they did turn those in, and there was a quite heavy uh, a penalty that came down on them. There were about 100 ballots that, that those people were, were disenfranchised from the voting because they forgot to turn those in, so we never encourage that, although the statutes do allow for that. And, and my, I would throw out that ballot harvesting has been going on in the United States since the Civil War. Yeah. When the, term and so, right? <laughs> the term came, came uh, poignant right. in the last couple of years. Right. Yeah. So uh, soldiers relinquished their ballot to their commanding officer who got it back to their home state, hometown. So we've been, you know, the United States has a long history of allowing people that they trust to take pick up their ballot and take it in and and it is a um it is a responsibility it's a sacred responsibility you do not ever want to discover that you failed to drop your friend's ballot into the ballot box even if it's a you know landslide election or anything um it's it's a sacred responsibility that you're taking on you know, I would suggest just to move things a little bit to one side that the media are focusing disproportionately on mail-in balloting right now, largely because Donald Trump is, um, and because of the COVID, um, you know, conditions under which this election is being carried out. It's a logical thing to do rather than an aberration. Okay, what is interesting because one of the questions we were given in advance asked about media coverage of of the campaigns and elections. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I'm sorry. Um, let me see if I can find exactly what the question was. Oh, what role does journalism play in elections and how does it educate us about significant issues in our communities? I'm gonna use this as an example of how bad the media are at helping us. Um, the much more significant story, and it has been the case for a generation, right, is voter suppression, not voter fraud, but voter suppression. Most Americans don't know that since 1982, the National Republican Party has been under a consent decree that prohibited it from engaging in certain kinds of activities with respect to campaigns because they had so thoroughly violated existing laws with respect to voter suppression and voter intimidation. That only lapsed in January of 2018. So between 1982 and 2018, the GOP was not allowed to engage in certain kinds of practices because they had been shown by overwhelming evidence functionally to have engaged in criminal acts of voter intimidation and voter suppression. That hasn't gone away 
That hasn't gone away at all, that whole effort to do that. And, and in fact, when you're talking about, you know, the corrupt part of, of ballot harvesting or voter suppression or any of that kind of stuff and voter fraud, where that's been prosecuted, it's almost always been tossed. It's, it's not been across the board. It's been disproportionately one party. And that's partly because of what I mentioned before the break. The GOP is a small minority party. And in fact, increasingly, it's a programmatic European style ideological party. Okay, that's not the kind of party that's designed to do well in a large national election with only two major parties. So again, how do you govern as a minority by suppressing the majority? Okay, right. and uh, again, I don't wanna make this an indictment of rank and file Republicans in the electorate, but we have to be honest about this and this is not being covered. And if I can go into it if you wanna know why, but this story simply is not being covered in the mainstream media. And it's being presented as though it's some sort of a distortion or conspiracy theory. I'm sorry, but I'm kind of immune to those things. And this is an astonishing breach of integrity by the national media. Because the thing about media coverage of, of elections, particularly at the national level, is everything that, that Chris and Kathy were talking about with relatively low turnouts and the difficulty of turning people out in local and even state elections is a consequence in large part of media coverage. Media simply don't cover what are called off-year election cycles, right. when the president's not running for election, re-election, or contestation, okay? That's an artifact of the media and demonstrates one thing that media coverage does is it stimulates interest, which in turn stimulates turnout. If the media back off, if they don't convince us by their attention, okay, that we should pay attention, a vast sea of Americans simply stop looking, you know, and they start watching reality TV or something. Um, we are not an attentive electorate. It's always a challenge to get Americans to pay attention. We have strikingly low levels of knowledge about our political system, about individual candidates, about the nature of elections, about the differences in principle and policy between the two parties when you compare us to any other industrialized democracy. We are right in the basement of all that. That is directly a consequence of two things, our educational system and the media, okay? And so what that means is that because of those failures at those levels, it's actually easier to get away with, or it, it creates a perverse incentive for people to go ahead and try to suppress the vote because it's easier to mislead people. It's easier to intimidate people. It's easier to frighten people when they don't understand the protections they actually have. I mean, both um, Chris and Kathy have invoked the word sacred with respect to the integrity of the vote. You know, that phrase is used in a kind of cavalier way. But a lot of a lot of Americans, particularly younger Americans, poorer Americans, more mobile Americans, underemployed Americans, they're afraid of everything because they're put in a position of fear. All right. So it's easy to intimidate them. It's easy to lie to them. And if you're not knowledgeable, it's easy to persuade you of something incredibly stupid. Okay. That that is really, I would argue, the biggest story at the national level. And you don't see people covering that. You just don't. I that's fascinating. Uh, in Jackson County in 2008, 8,000 more people voted for Barack Obama than voted for any of the down ballot Democrats. 6,000 more voted for Merkley than any of the down ballot Democrats. On the Republican side, John McCain got 124 more votes than the down ballot Republicans. Now, it, with very little effort, I was able to find out that in the last last days, Fox News went to, you know, I guess largely watched by uh, GOP uh, participants, they said, vote and vote all the way down. And by golly, they did. Mm -hmm. And we did not. And that, and, and all Democrats lost on the down ballot there. So you're, you're like, pay attention at the media you're right they really energize people to vote and they we get all excited about the president where as as chris was pointing out the, the down ballot races actually impact your life every single day in every single way and and we really want people to know the candidates know who they are what they stand for and then and and vote vote for your down ballot candidates from whatever it might be. I mean, soil, you know, <laughs> managers or you know, all, all of all of that is important. And um, but the media is always focused at the top of the food chain. 
And also, if I could, um, media typically help us not at all in understanding what the issues are in play. Really, they don't. Um, much less, you know, at the national level, they don't certainly ignore it at the state and local level most of the time, particularly local. That's, as, as um, Kathy suggests, you know, there are two real key issues that are largely local. One of them is education and the other is infrastructure, okay? And I mean, you know, just the classic thing of potholes in the street and the quality of your kid's education. Those are some of the most significant issues every community faces, and particularly small communities, rural communities, the most vulnerable. And yet, you get strikingly little coverage by that. In addition to that, at the national level, those issues are largely ignored because what it becomes is a partisan horse race. And that has always been the case, but it's even more so now in terms of, we saw a lot of us have done content analysis of the way media cover um, national campaigns. Um, it, it can be argued to have begun at the same time as the alignment. Okay, Patrick Cadell wrote a memo to Jimmy Carter during the transition, transition in 1976, and that was where he first encountered the term continuous campaign. That is that trying to recover from this debacle of the Nixon and Ford years, you know, culminating in the pardon of Richard Nixon, Patrick Cadell, who was a significant political operative in, in both California politics and national, um, was saying, you have to engage in a continuous campaign you have to be on the campaign trail forever now. The problem is media have taken that to heart as well so that everything is covered in terms of the campaign, almost nothing in terms of governance. Most Americans have no idea what Donald Trump has done or not done, what Joe Biden in 47 years in elective office has done or not done. That's not our fault. It's our responsibility, but it's not our fault. We need sources of information for that. And if you're not like me and you don't do it for a living, if you're not like Kathy, you don't do it for a living, or Chris, you know, you're not going to know because no one's going to help you. That's criminal. So um, we're about 15 minutes left or so, and I wanted to turn um, a question to the, that was in the chat box about voters who may feel they lack agency, um, or at least they feel that their vote la lacks agency, and they asked if there's a sense of electro electoral college controversy and issues like gerrymandering have increased voter apathy. And they wonder if the vote by mail, while well, vote by mail can um, be an apathy buster, what other things can bring more people into the process? I don't think vote by mail necessarily has anything to do with voter apathy. You have voter apathy is, you know, as I like to say in my world, apathy is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to activate who I want to activate, make sure they vote, and I'm not going to activate other people. Um, so the thing about vote by mail is it it just makes it easier for people to vote. It just does. You don't have to get, like I said, childcare, or, you know, your car's broken down or whatever. Uh, you got to work. Um, all of that has been taken away. And so now you are just, you've got your ballot in your hand and you got to get it in by eight o'clock. And, you know, the whole thing with Trump saying, oh, we won't know for months. In Jackson County, I know within hours the outcome of the election. It's just like, this is, I don't know what the problem is elsewhere. But the Electoral College is an interesting question that um, Andrew brings up. Um, for example, if the Electoral College were done away with, states like Oregon, California, um, Texas, you know, uh, states in the South, Louisiana, all that, uh, there'd be a lot more campaigning done in secure blue or secure red states because now it's about the popular vote. We we never see a presidential candidate in Oregon. We just don't. Um, they'll occasionally do a flyby in Portland, but they're certainly not down here. And that's because Oregon's going to vote blue. And it doesn't vote blue necessarily for governor or secretary of state or, or any of those, but uh, presidential, pretty sure it's going to go blue. Um, up until recently, Arizona didn't need anybody campaigning there. Louisiana, whatever, uh, Utah. So you have these ex the Dakotas and whatnot. You have the extreme um, uh, partisan states, whether they're blue or red, they get little or no attention. The 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 candidates running for president have little or no idea who those people are, what's important to them, uh, the issues that matter. 
because they, they don't campaign there. They don't have to. It's a waste of time. It's, you know, sort of like I said, gee, I focus my attention on five precincts in Jackson County. Well, they're focusing on five states in the United yeah. States. And that's, um, that would change if it became the popular vote. Well, and normally on the West Coast, we, our polls close at eight o'clock election night. And by that time, and in a lot, most all presidential elections, they've already called, unless it's so close that they can, and it's based on somewhat maybe the electoral vote. But by that time, and, and to me, that's also could be looked at as voter suppression because there are people that wait. They are adamant, I'm waiting till eight o'clock to cast my ballot or right before. How many of those voters just didn't cast their ballot because they thought, ah, it's over. You know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and they're all already calling the race. So um, yeah, there are a lot of things. It's, it's just, it's kind of a crazy, um, it's a crazy look at, at how politics work in, um, in, this, in the country. You know, and also on the county, I really appreciate your different perspectives, Bill and uh, Kathy, because I look at it from what I've been tasked to do and what I've been elected to do. And that's make sure that every person, it doesn't matter what political party or not, that their voice is heard in this process. And, and I really love hearing the different substantive items when you deal as a campaign manager, as a professor, professor um, and, and dealing with these issues, because I know I'm so focused on what we're doing to make sure that the election goes off and that the integrity of that election is upheld of utmost importance to make sure that we have a, a, an election. It doesn't matter to me at this point which way it goes. It's making sure that our voters, the voice is heard during this process and that we don't have any voter suppression, that we have everybody can easily access a ballot and be able to cast that ballot. So I, I really appreciate hearing your takes on this. Yeah, in terms of things that can stimulate or suppress turnout, I would argue, yeah, the Electoral College in a, in a kind of arithmetic way does in fact distort to the point of suppression. And it does it in this way, in that if you live in a very large populous state like California, and that's, I'm, you know, I'm a California boy, even though I've been here a quarter of a century, I'm still a California boy. So, um, I'm a nice one though, I try to be respectful of Oregon and all <laughs> cool about it, but um, it, like my, I was just talking to my sister about this before this meeting. Um, and when she votes, okay, and somebody in, let's say, I don't know, Wyoming votes or South Dakota, they've just gained the equivalent of thousands of votes for their one vote because of the arithmetic, arithmetic of the Electoral College. So her vote as an individual is watered down, is diluted. The two things that are key to convincing people to vote, okay, and I don't just mean, you know, like tricking them into voting, but actually inspiring them to vote, okay, are the notion of having agency and efficacy. Agency is solved largely, right, by everything that Chris was talking about with mail-in balloting. That's, that's a kind of agency that's just magic. It really is. And Americans love their convenience. The problem is efficacy. The idea that, you know, it's worth doing. That it's not just like that abstract civic obligation, but just participating in this and paying attention is important. But like I know here, okay, that it really doesn't matter how I vote for president. I know who's going to win. Okay, that depresses the value of my vote. Okay, and it's built into the system. But if it's a popular vote, and we did away with the Electoral College, a lot more states come into play. And suddenly, that narrative of, of efficacy becomes so much easier to demonstrate than, than it, yeah, agency, we've, we've kind of solved if people would just get with the program. Efficacy is the bigger challenge. And by that, mean, I don't mean apathy. Uh, you know, not very many Americans are genuinely apathetic. I mean, they don't care. They're confused, they're frightened, and they're angry. None of those is apathy. But all of them suppress voter turnout. All of them. All of them do. Well, they always say where a lot of people, we get comments all the time, my vote doesn't count or one vote doesn't make a difference yeah. at the local levels um, and cumulatively nationally they do matter because we've had many races uh, that fall within that one-fifth of one percent. We've even had races they've had to flip a coin because it was a tie, um, literally after a recount. So 
ultimately, again, those local races are so hugely important. And, and I think that's one area that we need to do better to get people, to give them that efficacy to want to turn out. There is a reason why you need to vote. Um, but right now, it's just hard. During the presidential elections, everybody turns out. But it, like I said, those local elections are so very important. Um, again, the bottom line, it's your daily life that's affected by those. But it's just really hard to, to, have to have get them to want to, to turn out to vote. Um, and like I said, we do make it as easy as we can. We send everybody a ballot. You just have to choose to participate. And, and that's the link that, that, that seems to be broken, um, especially at local elections. That's right. And the challenge there is how do you inspire people to have sufficient confidence in the electoral process as an institution mm -hmm. when yeah. constantly you're hearing someone of utmost political prominence telling you in every public opportunity carried by every network that this is a rigged election and that if one candidate loses, it can only be because it's rigged. There are a lot of people who are going to buy into that. Um, I taught a class once on conspiracy theories and the absolute laboratory for conspiracy theories in the 20th century is the United States. It really is. It's a combination of ignorance and a peculiar kind of agency because of our First Amendment right to express. That we love to tell stories and we love stories told to us, but we're getting a kind of uh, morality play that's completely fictional. A kind of, uh, you know, struggle of good and evil like we have really not heard in this country, arguably since the Civil War, where it's just that if you are not for one person, more than one party, if you don't support that cult of personality, it's almost as though you're a traitor. Okay, I've not heard that in 40 years of adult life covering and being actively involved in politics. I've never heard even, I mean, I came out of a very, very radical cohort of people who came of age in the late 60s, early 70s. And I didn't even buy that. You know, I mean, conspiracy theories were silly, but now yeah. people buy them, yeah. you know? And so that can, to apropos what Chris is saying, um, that can really make people ambivalent about participating because they're gonna believe, they're gonna default to, it's probably rigged anyway. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's absolutely toxic for the integrity of every political institution at every level of government. And yet, that's the narrative right now. It really is. And, and it's not, and, by the way, it's not just Donald Trump. And the ease of that information being out there, like, and I'm not blaming social media, but it has even pushed it more to the forefront. Because before yeah. you had, you had the, the local news media, you had talk radio, you had things such as that, uh, print media. And now with social media, probably the biggest a uh, single issue we're battling now is disinformation that's out there. Um, there might be an inkling of, of uh, fact-based information, but then it is blown out of proportion. And we spend, I would say, 75% of our day with phone calls, um, with emails, things trying to respond to everyone and trying to give them um, confidence in what we're doing at the local level. So it really has that disinformation out there and not just disinformation from foreign players. Uh, what we see on a regular basis is disinformation at the domestic the local <laughs> level. Um, and that is really what in the last since the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Twitters has come out. It is just really uh, tenfold in our department. Something even eight years ago we weren't dealing with, 10 years ago, are absolutely at the forefront right now. Absolutely. I, and I do blame social media, by the way. You can have fairly intelligent people that I just seem to seemingly make numbers up. Uh, on, I got on social media because um, I was concerned about uh, the attacks made on the city of Ashland and people say, no, it's mismanaged and this and that. And, and, and uh, viewers were just accepting it at face value, not understanding that we have a cap on our property taxes and you know, uh, a lot of other things. And I would take those numbers to the city and say, verify these numbers, where are they right or where are they wrong? Um, when I posted on Next Door Neighbor that there was, uh, that Chris Walker within <laughs> a few hours agreed to and got installed a Dropbox uh, behind the library for, for voting. Uh, one of the people on there said, and you trust Chris Walker? And like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I do. I mean, 
this is an incredibly ethical person who is all about helping people vote. And, but there's, I mean, how can you, I mean, if you have something as fundamental as that of people on social media questioning um, the integrity of your top, um, uh, you know, your, your county clerk, that's just bizarre land. That is just too weird. I, I, I don't even know how to respond to it. Well, yeah, I do trust her. And then you come back with all these people saying, no, no, it's all corrupt and it's all this and that. And, and others believe it. Uh, you know, when I disagree with numbers that are on there, people say, well, then give us the right numbers. I said, you know what? This is all public information. You can get it as easily as I just got it. No, we want you to tell me, well, people just want to be spoon fed with this stuff and conspiracies and, and, and bad data, it tends to win the day. And, 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 and by golly, a lot of government is so complicated and so um, difficult for people to access and understand with their very busy lives and work and pandemics and kids and teaching them at home and stuff. Yeah, they just want, just tell me what I need to know. And, and yet all of that is out there. We have a responsibility to become informed about our local government and our state government and our federal government and not just listen on the federal level to what the media tells us we need to, to pay attention to. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, I watch the news hour because they dare to be boring. And, and I think um, the other stations are just too, too extreme for me, you know, to spend much time with, whether it's MSNBC or CNN or Fox, it's just like, now I'll just wait for the news hour. So, um, I think media certainly plays a role in this. They want to sell time. I get it. Uh, but social media has been a huge problem for, for generating and, and um, uh, re regurgitating uh, um, disinformation that people then take as the gospel. And that's why DHS and CISA this year through the Department of Homeland Security has really, if you haven't noticed, the EAC Elections Administration Commission has really taken the forefront in trying to talk about that. This information is huge out there. Um, they are trying to be a great partner with us. Um, my biggest thing and the way we run our office locally is transparency. We want you to see what we do. If you have questions, rather than taking something verbatim that's on social media or put out the call us and ask, a process and procedure, um, the law, how it's written, um, uh, the vote by mail manual spells out exactly how we run elections. Uh, we want people to see what we do. And the biggest way we can get rid of the bad information is the transparency and by people asking questions. Don't just assume, ask us. And, and, and that's what we're here for. Now, there might be some things that, that you didn't want to hear, but we're going to give you fact-based information at the local level. Um, we're, we're not just going to have you go on social media and start listening to 25 people talking about what ifs and, and this is what we think is happening or the disinformation. Just ask. That's all we ask. Um, we're, we're available for you for that. That's right. Yeah. So we're about, about 7.30. Um, so our program is about an, at an end. Um, Kathy, Bill, and Chris, did, did you want to just say a final word on voting before we end our program? Sure. I'll, I'll toss something out if I could. Um, yeah. Something to keep in mind with respect to everything we've talked about and, and, and the power of misinformation, and suppression, and distortion. And this goes back to 1978, and a young Georgia congressman was meeting in caucus with other Republicans and kept advancing this theory that the way for the Republican Party to emerge as what he believed could be a majority party was first to compel Americans to distrust and fear their own government, and then tie that distrust and fear to the party that controlled it. Okay, again, I'm not trying to make this a partisan issue. It just happens that historically, overwhelmingly, it is. Okay, so that we have this challenge going forward, you know, and that is, you know, what do we do when we have a minority party that speaks that loudly? 
you know, in, in a nation of, you know, 320 million people. We haven't figured that out yet. We're not getting any help from the media. We're certainly not getting any help from either one of the political parties. But I think that's a fundamental challenge going forward. How do, how do we learn again to trust those institutions? Chris or Kathy, you want final thoughts? Yeah, I I'll think go. Bill, Bill said it best. <laughs> go ahead, Kathy. No, I, I just agree with what you said before and what Bill just said. I, it's, I have nothing more to say on it. Well, thank you. So all I'm going to do is give a plug that, uh, you know, the county clerk, we are the voice and will for all of our citizens. It doesn't matter what political party they are. So we're not going to get into the politics of all that. Uh, we are here for you. Um, keep in mind, registration deadline is October 13th. Our ballots for Jackson County voters will be dropped at the Coastal Processing facility right here in Medford on October 16th. You will see those ballots as soon as the very next day. Our drop boxes will officially open on October 19th, although we do a soft opening the day ballots go out for those early voters, just to accommodate um, everyone who decides to vote early. And the drop dead deadline, make sure you don't mail past the 27th of October use our official ballot drop boxes after that time or come to our office. November 3rd is election day. Make sure we have them by eight o'clock at night. Um, get your voice heard. And, and let me also uh, jump on what she just said. Yeah. Uh, if you can't find your ballot, go to Jackson County elections and they'll give you a provincial ballot. You can vote then and they hang on to it as she said. So don't worry if you've lost your ballot, you can't find it or whatever. Uh, you can still vote all the way up to election day. So, yeah, we give you a replacement ballot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have very few provisional ballots in Oregon um, because uh, once in a while we get somebody who's not registered, we can't locate them in the system, but most of it's just a replacement or a um, reissued ballot. So, um, okay. Can we also how many people, how many people get absentee? The, the, the deadline for registration is October 13th. If you're not registered, not registered anywhere in the state of Oregon, right? If you're currently registered anywhere, you have other options up to eight o'clock election night. Right. And, and how many people have requested an absentee ballot, like military or out of the state or? We have vacation? under a thousand um, military and overseas voters. Um, we call them UACAVA voters. It's a federal, federal act. Um, and their ballots all go out 45 days prior to the election. We did meet that deadline. Um, and then, of course, yesterday was absentee ballots, and those went out uh, for out-of-state absentee voters, several thousand. Um, and then, of course, now we're into the bulk of our ballots, which will be the uh, ballots that go out on October 16th. As of today, before I left to come home, we did break 160,000 registered voters here in Jackson wow. County. So wow. our registration has gone up uh, considerably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate Kathy, Bill, and Chris sharing your expertise with us tonight and talking about how voting matters. Um, we are about almost five minutes over, so I think I'm going to end the meeting to be respectful of people's time, but thank you again so much. This is so informative and such a great interactive conversation, so thanks again for your time and expertise.